All right, who's the youngest in the room? I don't know which one of y'all is going to be the youngest. I would have given it to him, but he made fun of me for being old. <laughs> Are you the youngest in the room? Probably. All right. Good to see you. And who is the oldest in the room? Anybody want to own up to this? This is being recorded, but it is not being videoed, so nobody will actually know who it is. Anybody want to claim being the oldest in the room? Nobody wants? Longest serving elder in the room. Yeah, you'll claim the oldest. There you go. All right. Who is the newest elder in the room? Anybody up there in the room? I mean, I'll be there. Anybody? How long have you been doing it? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just motioning. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's like when you're at the office and you scratch your nose. So, that is not technically bribery, but I thought surely if they say, man, I had to climb upstairs and he bored me to death. But he gave away books, so I was okay. <laughs> so... Reach Church for some time has been talking about the decline in Christianity at large in the United States for some time. And it, it's just been around a long, long time. Let me mention, by the way, anybody that wants my PowerPoints, let me know. I'll stack up some cards here and I'll send them to you. But I think back, this is some Gallup research that's from 2014. They had five key indicators they look at. I don't know if I remember all of them, but it's standard things like how important is religion in your life? How often do you read scripture? How often do you pray? How important is religion in moral decisions you make? How often do you worship with Christians, etc.? And so that consistently, they all of their metrics were down. I think of some research that I came across in the end, it was December of 2021 that came, it was put out by Pew Research Company, looking at a lot of those same things. How important is religion in your life? How often do you pray? Scripture? What What is the basis of your moral decisions? And how, how much does religion or Scripture play in that? What's your view of Scripture? Is it literal? Is it figurative? Is it inspired? Is it not inspired? And over and over, all of the metrics are down. And one of the things that came out of you probably heard a lot from a lot of different sources. Pew Research has shown it. Others have as well. The largest religious group in the United States is the nuns. And I'm not talking about the nuns in relation to the Catholic Church. It's those who don't have religion at all. They're atheists, agnostics, or no particular religion. Now, there some would argue that uh, some of those, it may be a misunderstanding of the question. But even if we allow for some in that regard, it is obvious that number is rising. 29% according to Pew Research of Americans have no religious affiliation at all, which has a bearing on a lot of things, especially personal evangelism. We're no longer starting with people who already believe with God. We're starting with people who don't believe with God in God and get into at least be open to God. So it's a totally different part, starting place in, a, in personal evangelism. But And then for those under the age of 30, for those who work a lot in Christian higher, edu higher education and heritage, we're a little bit different animal. Our average student age is 36, but most of our brotherhood schools, that number is going to be this group. 36% of those under the age of 30 have no religious affiliation at all. Now, what was interesting is the weekend, Easter weekend, there was Laura Ingram with Fox News did an interview with Andy Stanley who is, it's, there's a community church, North Point, outside of Atlanta, and some of you may have read some of his writings and so forth. So she did an interview with him talking about some of that, and it was flowing out of a new study that had just been put out by Wall Street Journal that said, among other things, that 39% of Americans, only 39% of Americans says religion was very important in their lives. That for most of Americans, even if they would say, I'm a Christian, it's just really not that important to them. And so she asked him a question as a leader in the general larger Christian religious world. Why, why is this happening? What is it that's telling us? What he said to me was very eye-opening. So let me just read it for you. People have lost faith in institutional leadership in general, beginning with the political and also spiritual. The problem is that to some extent, leadership has been reduced to follow me because I hate the same people you hate. Follow me because I fear the same people that you do. And that is terrible leadership. 
A leader has to have an enemy, a leader who has to have an enemy in order to lead is a bad leader. And as Christians and as a faith community, we should know better because Jesus is very clear about this. His message was that just because someone considers you their enemy, you do not have to return the favor. He goes on to talk about, I think they've got 10 campuses uh, for their particular religious group that are scattered around the Atlanta area. And so he says, we have a lot, we have thousands of Gen Zs and thousands of millennials. And what we have discovered is that when people open the Gospels, they see a differentiation between the type of leadership we see in our country and even the type of leadership we see in our churches. So consequently, as a result of that, they are kind of done with institutional religion and even to some degree institutional politics. So it's a leadership problem and it's a messaging problem. Do you agree or disagree? Think about where we're at. Is there a problem? Think about the climate that exists in our culture and in our churches. He says far too often we're motivating people against somebody or by what we're commonly upset about instead of motivating people on the fact that God has a mission in the world and He has a church to participate in that mission. And we're calling people to be like Christ and to participate in that mission. And that yes, we are against someone. But He doesn't reside on earth. He resides in hell. I want us to think about Leadership. It was interesting knowing that I was going to be talking about what we've been asked to talk about today as I watched through that video. I'm wrestling with, you don't, you don't have to agree with him, but I do think we need to at least ask ourselves a question, is there room for improvement in leadership in the church? I do think that's a valid question, whether you agree with his particular wording necessarily. We were asked to talk about Leadership lessons in James. It's always interesting when you speak places to kind of say, what are the topics they're going to assign? And sometimes you're like, oh yeah, we've talked about that. Bill says, oh, I've done that a thousand times, right? And sometimes you'll get a topic. Every once in a while you'll get that. It doesn't happen often. Every once in a while you get a topic like, what were they thinking? I don't know where they're going with this. And you have to call somebody, what do you mean? Okay, we're good. I just needed to know what, what you meant by that title. And sometimes it's like, okay, I get what they're saying. I'd never thought about that before. Or I haven't done that much. That's new to me. And I don't know about, I'm about with you. I kind of get excited when somebody gives me, and I'm like, oh, I haven't done that. that. That's really good. I'm excited about that. So as I thought about leadership lessons in James, maybe that's something you've done a lot. I do a lot in leadership. I do reading and writing in leadership all the time and do leadership workshops and conferences. And I focused a lot of scripture places in the Bible. I've done conferences where we focused on Moses or we focused on Joshua, you know, where we focused on Nehemiah, where we've looked at Paul or we've looked at different New Testament leaders, but especially love focusing on Jesus as a leader. And so there's different books and different folks that, you know, we've kind of did we dove into them for a day or for a weekend or for a book. But I thought, you know, I don't ever remember doing a lesson on leadership lessons in James. James is an awesome book. I never thought of it as a go-to book on leadership. I do think it's a great go-to book on just being a Christian that lives his real faith. But I never thought it as leadership. And it was a reminder to me of something that I've often said but needed to be reminded of. I don't know about you. I, I'm a connoisseur of study Bibles. Because I find a good study by I find if you've got a good Bible software, like I like Accordance, I use a Logos sometimes. If I've got good Bible software and a good collection of study Bibles, I'm ready to roll on about anything. Okay? <laughs> and so I've got a bunch of different ones, but one of my favorite, because of my passion for leadership, is the Maxwell Leadership Bible. It's, uh, I think, available in the New King James and NIV. I think I've actually got two copies, a larger one and a smaller one of the, NK, the New King James Version. 
But what is neat about it is, I mean, you've got the text, so it's a winner. If everything else is awful, you at least got the good part. <laughs> but also what I like about it, other than I lost my battery, is that, is, have any of you ever read any uh, Maxwell's books? Well, see, if you get the Bible, they're all in there, and you don't have to buy them anymore. It's, it's a two for the price of one plus a dollar. You get the text, but also you what he tries to do is as he goes through the whole Bible, he is saying, where do I see leadership here? And he'll make an observation. And so I've really enjoyed that reading. If you ever kind of read, sometimes read through your Bible. If you read through your Bible many times, read through it with a different perspective each time. This year I'm going to read through looking for connection to Jesus all the way through. This year I'm going to read through with this perspective. Sometimes read through your Bible, every book, thinking of where's leadership here. And so I've, I've, I've done that with him, and then I got to thinking, but I really haven't explored more in James. So I was, I was kind of excited about us wrestling with this for a few moments today because there are a lot of leaders in this book. You think of James himself, potentially the brother of Jesus. He's a leader in the early church. It's very clear in the book of Acts that that's what's going on, if that's who this, this is, that he's a leader in the early church. You've got Job that is referred to and Abraham that's referred to. You've got the prophets and teachers and elders. So as we think about James, you know, as you've been seeing, it's kind of the Christian book of Proverbs. It's got a lot of Jewish flavor to it. It's really all about living out one's faith. And it seems to be dealing with some folks facing persecution, trying to encourage them to stay in there and live out their faith in the face of, per faith in the face of persecution. It's trying to correct some problems and assemblies and attitudes in the, and then uh, ultimately trying to get them to have a lived out faith. Not a faith in theory or faith in title, but a, a faith in statement, but a faith in life. A, a faith that is lived <coughs> out in action. Right? So it talks about the testing of faith in chapter 1, the traits of faith, and then the triumph that comes at the end of the book when we pull together and help each other to live out our faith. And so we'll actually talk about that later too as a part of what we're looking at. But I wanted to notice here what Maxwell says. James is the kind of book you ought to read standing up. It contains a ringing call for action, a plea for vital Christianity, and a faith that demonstrates itself not in mere words but in lifestyle. But here's what I really like, because again, what I appreciate about him is he's looking at every book from a leadership perspective. And you may not always agree with what he finds, but I find it helpful to be challenged to look for leadership like the Lord in every book. He goes on to say, James models a leadership weary of sterile mission statements framed on a wall. Let me stop for a moment. Every meeting room and office in our building has our mission step, uh, statement framed. At least every other faculty staff meeting, we read it in the meeting. In each board meeting, in my presentation, we begin with it. And it is regular in our administrative council meetings. But it means nothing if it's just on the wall. And that's what he's saying. He says, James models a leadership weary of sterile mission statements framed on the wall. He cares nothing for the set of core values that subcommittee that the subcommittee wrote down last year if they are only words on paper and they got filed away. That gets personal too because if you walk in our main auditorium, our ten core values, five are on one wall and five on the other. It's great only if they see it in the lives of the people that are in the pews in between those core value statements. He then goes on to say, he is an activist who labels as self-deceived those who say they are committed to do something but never do. So for James, if you don't get anything else, if you stop, walk out of the room, for James, Christianity and leadership are action words. They're not titles we wear. They are not descriptive terms so much as they're how we live. Christian, Christ, being a Christian means I live a certain way. And for him, leadership is not a title. It's something I do in a Christian way. And so what I'd like to do is just, as I walk through it, then what does, in James' view, what does a lived out leadership look like? What does leadership in action look like? So I kind of want to think of three different areas as time allows. I want us to begin our journey in James chapter 2. The first observation I notice is I look the book. First of all, everything in the book can be applied to leadership. Okay, but what are we going to do? We're going to look through all five chapters and every verse and every word understanding that 
All of the principles he's talking about ought to be in the lives of every Christian, therefore in the life of every leader. We accept that as we begin. But let's are there some sections where he seems to be specifically talking about people in positions of leadership? And first of all, I find discussions in chapter 2 and chapter 5 of problems of power <clears throat> and how they are viewed, how they allow themselves to be viewed, and how they view other people. Because if you look in chapter 2, he deals with how they treat people who come into their assemblies. Now when he talks about the word assembly, there is the word for synagogue. May just be a by that point it may just be that that term for synagogue is a generic term for a gathering or an assembly. We know that our word church was the generic word for assembly. That's the word they would use to say, "Hey, we're going to assemble something." But in this case, the word synagogue can have that synonymous meeting, or it may literally be just referring to the fact that a lot of the early churches were meeting in synagogues. But the point is, when they came together as a church, they were treating people by different. Distinctions. They were treating people differently based on their wealth. So you've got someone in elaborate clothing, someone wearing rings. We know that Roman senators often had signet rings, but it wasn't just in the Roman culture. There were many ancient cultures where having certain rings meant power or wealth, etc. If you had a, a certain ring that allowed you to put a certain stamp in the wax that you put on a letter. It influenced who would read that letter and how far it could go. There was power in a ring, I'm saying. And it wasn't just Green Lantern, okay, for those of you that are the comic book folks. But also in clothing. Clothing said something. And, and as you think about this whole clothing discussion, remember for a lot of the poor, they had one. They had one. So is that thing getting washed and cleaned every day? So you got the folks who've got clothing piled up and then you got the one who has one. So when they walk in the building, it's not just that the clothing costs more or it costs less. That's a factor too. It's one is clean and the other's not. Because the one can afford to have a whole bunch of them and pay somebody else to clean it, and the other can't. And so they were making distinctions based on they treated people based on that. He talks about sitting at my footstool. Many believe, and I think about when I, I was living in Israel uh, after I got out of college from the places I visited. Sometimes you'd have like these benches along the wall, and then you would have a carved out footrest down at the bottom. And so some think that's the idea. You kind of sit here on the floor where we usually prop our feet up. The point of it is you can you can take it and apply it to your building. I can apply it to my building. Do we treat people differently? Because remember, as you think about it, you may say, what does this have to do with leadership? Who has the power? The people with the money. They either have money because they have power or they have power because they have money. But they are the controllers of society. Some of the other stuff we're going to talk about is about what leadership looks like in the church. This is talking about general cultural leadership. Those who, who own the factories or in their culture, those who own the farms. Those who have the wealth and those who have the power. And it deals both with how they view people and how they are being viewed. And so you've got this person who doesn't have wealth and power. You treat that person one way. But this person with wealth and power, you treat another way. And he goes on to talk about the absurdity of this because he said, and, and an underlying thing in the book of James is that there seems to have been a major problem of the wealthy abusing power. We know in the Roman judicial system that it favored those in power. They had a political worldview, if you will, that the lower masses, that they were self-motivated because of their poverty. So if they brought an accusation that their, their poverty caused them to have improper motives. And so if they made an accusation, it's not because that guy with wealth actually did anything. It's just because you want more money. But surely the guy with all that money, surely he wouldn't have impure motives. And so that was the Roman political system's philosophy, even though it went against several other ancient philosophies. It went against what Scripture says in the Old Testament. It went uh, against what a lot of the rabbis were saying, etc. But there is an underlying problem in the book of James with people who have power and position abusing that power and position to hurt people, to use people to get more power and position. And so he talks about that why would you do that 
when often those are the folks you're actually catering to the people who are abusing you, not paying you, taking you to court, and yet they're the ones you're catering to. Why do you think they're catering to them? They don't want to be abused or taken to court. Does that ever come into leadership in the church? Who do you cater to? In the congregation, who do you cater to? Who gets the most ear of the elders? Does the guy who's the CEO of a corporation have any more say in the congregation sometimes? The guy that's always causing trouble? The one that's always threatening lawsuits? Which ones do we listen to? I think if we're honest with a lot of these things we see in Scripture and in the book of James, it may not be the exact same, but I think we can find some things that are flying pretty close to the same pattern. It may not be the same plane, but it's the same flight path. How do we use leadership and how do we view leadership? Do we over-exalt people? Do we cater to people within the congregation because of how much money they make or because of how much power they have or literally how much they complain? Does a squeaky wheel always get the grease? And then we wonder why the non-squeaky wheels came off because we were busy greasing the wrong wheels. And so he challenges us from a follower's perspective to think about how we view leaders, but he also challenges us as a leader to think about how we view other fo view followers and how we view other leaders. And where we invest our time, how we look at ourselves and how we look at others. And it really comes out in chapter 5 when he's directly addressing the <coughs> abusive wealthy. Is it sinful to be wealthy? No, Abraham was filthy rich. Okay? There are a lot of wealthy, I'm glad, Brian and I are glad they're wealthy people, right? Because both of us involved in works for God, that if God had not provided some people with the resources to do it, okay, we're going to have, at our, we only do Bible majors at our school. We're accredited, but everybody in our school is a Bible major. We don't, nobody has education degrees, but they have Bible degrees. So 25 are going to a graduate with Bible degrees at Heritage Christian, and none of them will have borrowed a dime because of wealthy Christians who said, I'm going to give my gifts for God. So we're not speaking against having money. We're speaking against money having people. And what he is dealing with is people who are in position, who have power, who own the land, who have people working for them, who are abusing the power and privilege. Because they can get away with it, they get away with it. And so they under-support people, bless you. They underpay people. <laughs> and you got to think about it in a world and in a culture. Let me ask you. If you didn't get your paycheck this week, will you still get to eat? I have bees. I can at least eat honey if all else fails. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's my apocalyptic plan. If <laughs> in the first century world, for a lot of people... No money today, no food today. There's none of this stored up in our refrigerator. Some of us work in Latin America. You go to Latin America, they got enough for one day's food in their fridge. The fridge is probably not big, big enough for much more than that. So what do they do? Every day when they go home from work, they buy what they're going to cook for supper on their way home. That's why in Scripture, in the Old Testament, it talks about you don't withhold somebody's income. You don't like wait and pay them the next day. Oh, I'm sorry, can't pay you today. Why? Because they're not going to eat today if they, you don't pay them. Well, they were taking advantage of people. They weren't paying them. They weren't taking care of them. And he says, you have this amazing imagery where he talks about how I, I cannot help but think of Genesis. The blood of your brother cries out to me in Genesis 4. He says... The pay you have withheld. The clothing that you have piled up and is moth-eaten while they have one change of clothing with holes in it is the K, the Kirk version, if you want. It. The fact that they don't have enough fun, money for supper and your money is rusting and rotting. I think of Jesus, lay not up for yourselves treasure on earth or moth and rust corrupt 
this is what it looks like when moth and rust corrupts. And so they've abused their position. He says, what you have withheld cries out. I want you to think about that. I'm assuming that many of us in this room are leaders in the church or in some work that we feel like is for God's glory. Where is there rust crying out against us? If Jesus comes back now, how much money is in your church bank account? It's real easy to judge these people. But if Jesus comes back and your church has a million dollars in the bank, see, I work at a Christian school, there's no problem, we're dead all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Will the homeless and hungry in our community, will the money in our church bank accounts cry out against us? For the missionaries who knocked on our doors and we said no to, will the money in our bank accounts cry out against us? For the youth ministers who had to go on the side and drive a school bus so they could have insurance, will the money in our bank accounts cry out against us? For the preacher, who had to get two degrees to get the job, who could barely feed his family paying school loans with the money in our bank accounts, cry out against us. Power can be abused in churches too. It seems to me as I look at these sections and I wrestle with playing favorites and playing with people's lives, letting them become a part of our power struggles, <coughs> that we can have a problem of lifting people up and allowing ourselves to be lifting up and looking down on others and forgetting that leadership is about a relationship. If you start reading a lot on leadership and especially look at definitions of leadership, two words you're going to keep seeing over and over are relationship and influence. That leadership is about in, in the spiritual realm, it's about an influence relationship that guides people towards God's goals for God's glory. But it flows out of a relationship. If I think I'm better than somebody else or they're less than me, if I don't value people, if I don't feel like my job is to invest in them and serve them and help them, instead I feel like their job is to help me get where I want to be, if I'm willing to sacrifice them so I can have some extra money in a bank account, that's not, that may be leadership in someone's definition. It's not spiritual leadership. And so it seems to me we've got to remember that leadership is about people and that people are not pawns in our leadership games and in our power struggles. So godly leadership in action lowers the leader and lifts the lead. Godly leadership in action lowers the leader and lifts the lead. You know the story, the Aesop fable, of the donkey with the lion skin. One day a donkey went down the road and found a lion carcass or skin that had been thrown aside by some hunters. So the donkey decided that he would have some fun, so he grabbed the skin, he put it over himself so he would look like a lion, he hid in the bushes, and then as the other animals of the forest came by, he would jump out and scare them and they would all go running off in terror and he was having so much in that and fun watching them run off in terror that he let out this loud bray. All the animals are running away, but the fox turns around and comes back. And so the donkey says to the fox, Why aren't you afraid? And he said, Well, I would have been afraid, but I heard your bray, and your bray gave you away. In other words, the fox said, What I'm seeing and what I'm hearing don't match. There's something out of sync here. All right, so does anybody notice anything about my outfit? What color is my suit? Gray. You notice anything else? Brown shoes. Brown shoes. Like when I was growing up, Mama said, you cannot wear brown with gray. Now that's like what you do. But pants and coat, do you notice anything? They're two different gray suits. 
I'm afraid as leaders, sometimes people look at us and say, there's something not matching here. And that's what James 3 and 4 is about. You think you're wise? You think you're a teacher? There's something that doesn't match. Your life, your claims, your words, how you talk about people, they're not syncing up for me. I may see a lion, but what I hear is a donkey. So as I look at James chapter 3, he says, let not many of you, or he, we'll come back to that moment, he says, who among you is wise and understanding? Let it, him show it by his good behavior. So I'm asking myself the question, okay, why, why does he do that? Why is he saying, here's what wisdom looked like. What wisdom looks like is living out. Don't claim something, do something. Be something. Living out your faith, that is true wisdom. Wisdom is not knowing something. It is living a certain way based on what you know. But why does he do that? So I chat back up. Okay, so for several years when I was teaching in Henderson, I was the deacon of education and missions. Anybody ever done that in the room? All right. So have you ever started a meeting of your Bible class teachers with this verse? Okay, I actually have, but I've never used it at a recruiting meeting. <laughs> all right. You know, like get up for VBS when you need somebody for all those classes. I think I, over the years I read 20 VBSs. And one of your challenges is having enough teachers to cover all those rooms. So you don't like get up on Sunday night. Let me read James chapter 1, 3 and verse 1. Now, who would like to teach the third grade class? Okay, it's not going to work that way. He begins that chapter. So sometimes I'm thinking about what he says in verse 13. I'm going to back up to the beginning. He begins the section by saying, let not many of you become teachers. Now, now we've got evidence in the Bible that we ought to become teachers. Elders ought to be apt to teach. Hebrews deal with the fact, though you ought to be teachers, you have to be taught. What's he talking about here? He's talking about those who selfishly are ambitious to become a teacher who are not godly teachers. Who want the position of leadership, but don't want to lead like the Lord. And so he says, don't let many of you become teachers. Because as a teacher, you're going to be held accountable. The more words come out of my mouth, the more I will be accountable for before God. Don't be behind me in line because we're going to be there a while if we're standing together at the judgment. Because I talk a lot. And that's terrifying. He says, the more I say, the more I'm accountable for I was talking to one of our vice presidents. He's only been a VP for a year, but I was talking to him the other day about how much I appreciate him. That he has been an amazing addition to our team. And I said, there's a number of things you do well, but here's one of the greatest values when we have a meeting of our VPs and when our administrative council gets together. You think through everything you're going to say. You listen to what everybody else in the room is saying. And then you speak. A bunch of us in the room, we speak and then think, kind of like Peter. You think and then speak. And that is a blessing to our team. He is saying, the more I say, and what does he begin the book by saying? Be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Why? Because the tongue is so dangerous and the tongue is so deadly. This one little fire can change everything. <coughs> I think about, I think it was September of 1995, 47,000 commuters were stranded that day in New York City on their lines running back and forth to work in the city because of one squirrel on one power. One sentence can destroy a life. One sentence can destroy an eldership. One sentence can destroy a church. So why is he saying be careful about the dangers of the tongue? Because he said some who are supposed to be godly Christian teachers, leaders in the classroom, are speaking ill of others. And he says, this doesn't match. This doesn't sync up. Okay, a fountain that's supposed to produce fresh water shouldn't produce salt water. 
A fig tree should produce figs. A vine should produce grapes. A Christian teacher should produce goodness and kindness and love and faithfulness and friendship. It shouldn't produce cursings. I think about a recent trip that I had to Panama. I work with the Bible School of America. They're trying to become self-sufficient. So they grow. They, they, they've got a tractor now and they're growing got this massive two or three acre garden so that they can produce food for the students. Uh, I keep bees. They want bees on campus. So we caught them some bees from a tree that fell so they can have their own honey. And I'd been gone a while and they had told me about, oh, six weeks ago, he said, hey, those bees we caught, they swarmed but there's still some bees left behind in the hive. And I said, okay, so you lose part of your workforce, you still got the honey, they'll rock on, make them a new queen, they'll be fine, I'll check on them when I get there. When we caught these bees in the tree, they, were, they couldn't be calmer. We literally, this tree had fallen, we're trying to chainsaw the tree. So I'd, I'd cut an opening, I'd reach as far as I could, get bees and comb out, put it in a box, I'd cut a little more, all day, not one of them stung me, not once. I go back, that's happened in December, I go back three weeks ago, and I go out to the same box, and I open the top to just make, I, I was gonna be in there five minutes max, just to move one thing out of the way, slide it on top, put it back together and rock on. Give them more room, they went crazy. They went crazy. All I had was a hood on and a t-shirt from here to here, the only thing that wasn't stung <laughs> was where my GoPro was mounted to the middle of my chest. <laughs> and they were dive bombing it. I have video of doo, 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 doo. <laughs> Hundreds followed me. I had to walk a half a mile away out into the middle of a field and stand for an hour before they would leave me alone. I couldn't run. It just makes it worse. They fly faster than people run, and it just makes them mad. If I smash them, they put off a pheromone. It puts everybody else in attack mode and makes it work. So I just have to chill and hope I don't die. One of the things I was struck with is that's not the same bees. It's the same box, but not the same bees. Probably it happened is when they swarmed they raised a new queen who probably mated with Africanized drones and the hive was Africanized. How do I know? Because they acted differently. Just because the outer casing is the same, teacher, elder, preacher, youth minister, doesn't mean that what flies out the front door is the same. And so what he's dealing with is what's flying out of your mouth? What are you saying about people? How do you treat people? He talks about their quarreling and their fighting. There's conflicts because there's power struggles. There's selfish ambition. They're after something for themselves instead of something for others. And so he says in chapter 411, don't speak against each other. I want to tell you there's something worse than Africanized bees. It's aggressive attacking Christians. I remember looking in the mirror, I counted 85 holes in my body. But I've had one single Christian say things about me and I would rather have the 85 again. It shouldn't be this way and that's the point he's making. That fig tree ought to be producing figs. That Christian ought to be producing Christ. And so what I do and what I say, what comes out of my mouth should matter. Maybe you've heard the Yiddish proverb or story of the, uh, the story of uh, the man who was spreading gossip. And as he was spreading gossip, he came to the rabbi he'd been spreading gossip about it and realized he'd done wrong and said, I'm so sorry I've wronged you. I've said all these awful things about you. How can I make it right? And the rabbi said, I want you to go home, get two pillows, to make sure they're feather pillows, I want you to go downtown to the square. I want you to rip them apart. And I want you to throw the feathers to the wind and come back. So he did that. He came back and said, I did exactly what you asked. What can I do now to make this right? He said, go back and gather up all the feathers. Then you will understand what happens when we say things that hurt people. Hmm. Leadership in action. 
lowers selfish ambition and raises wisdom. One other place I would encourage you to look at that we won't have time to look at is I would encourage you to look at chapter 5 where he says, if anyone is sick, who do you go to? The elders. And then at the end of the book, he talks about leading a brother back from sin and that you save a soul and sins are covered. I think that's the sins of the person who went astray. In the early church, when there were spiritual problems between the church in Antioch and Jerusalem in Acts 15, who was in the audience? The apostles were there, but also the elders. When Paul talked to Timothy about the beginning of his work, he talks about the laying of the hands of the presbytery, the eldership. And James, when you're sick, who do you go to? Let me ask you, if you're an elder, what do the members go to you for? If they go to you because somebody made them mad, if they go to you because they didn't like the carpet, if they go to you because the budget was too high, if they go to you because the sound system is messed up, that tells you what kind of leader they think you are. But if they go to you because their marriage is falling apart, if they go to you because they're scared and hurting and they want you to pray for them, if they go to you because they've got a biblical question that tells you what kind of a leader they think you are. And James 5 tells me that when leaders function like they should, when someone needs a prayer, their first thought is, I'm going to the elders. It's interesting when I look at the leadership in James, it's exactly like the leadership I see in Jesus. And in James, over and over in the book, there's all these connections to the Sermon on the Mount. That for James, leadership in action looks a lot like a cross. It looks a lot like Jesus. My hives have one queen, and every bee in that hive has the DNA of their queen. I think James is asking us as leaders, do we have the DNA of our King? Thank you for your attention.